For your chance to win a Paolo Di Canio signed and custom framed West Ham boot, plus the chance to win um, 15 instant West Ham prizes, go to footballprizes.co.uk for all the details. Terms and conditions apply and the very best of luck. Very good evening to you. Welcome to the West Ham Voice. Thank you for joining me. If you're new to the channel and if you like and appreciate the content, please consider becoming a subscriber of the channel. If you're an existing subscriber or if you're just passing through and you like and appreciate the content, please do hit that like button as well. Now, uh, amongst some of the criticisms currently being targeted at Huden Lopetegui is that he doesn't know his best team, nor does he have a clear pattern of play and no clear tactical plan. Now, I might beg to differ and I will try and explain why. Now, to be clear, I don't believe that everything Lopetegui is doing is working, uh, but that doesn't mean he isn't trying out different things for a purpose. In one of his first interviews at West Ham, and indeed in previous interviews before he even joined the club, he always talked about, he always stated that there is more than one way to playing a football match and that he would adapt according to the need, according to the opposition that he was up against. And on the whole, he's kind of kept to that philosophy since joining West Ham. Now, in the 11 games in all competitions that he's been in charge of, we have seen at least four different formations, as well as a number of different tactics being adopted. Now, while some may argue that this proves the point that he doesn't know what he's doing, uh, I would refer you back to his words in saying that he will adapt according to the opposition we're facing. We've seen a 4-2-3-1 formation. We've seen 4-1-4-1. We've seen 4-3-3. And latterly, uh, especially in the Man United game, we saw a 3-5-2 formation being used. We have seen our team try to keep more possession of the ball and where appropriate, we've tried to take the game to the opposition. We're witnessing a defensive high line as opposed to a defensive low block. And we have seen our fullbacks being afforded the freedom to roam forward in order to attempt to create more goal scoring opportunities. Now, as I said, it hasn't always worked out. And some of these tactics and formations, they do have their flaws, especially against certain opposition. But isn't it refreshing to have a head coach who is willing to try different approaches rather than the same thing over and over again? Now, on the whole, the football is different. And there are signs in some games we have played where if we hit a run of consistency, it could result in a purple patch of results this season. We've only got to look at the stats uh, to, be, uh, to start getting an overall picture of where we're at at this moment in time. Now, all right, the, the most important stat is the number of games that we've won. Uh, the number of games we've won, number of games we've drawn, number of games we've lost. And in all competitions so far, we've won four, we've drawn two, and we've lost five. Um, but uh, the five defeats, not that I'm using it as an excuse, but the five defeats have been against opposition such as Aston Villa, Man City, Chelsea, Liverpool and Spurs. Now, these teams, uh, many would argue, are the teams that who we should be competing against in order to get, back, get ourselves back into Europe. And I can't argue with that either. The two draws have been against Fulham and Brentford, who, on the whole, are around about our level. And the, and the uh, wins that we've ha had uh, have been against Crystal Palace, Bournemouth, Ipswich and Man United. Teams we should be beating. And yes, I do include a very poor Man United side in that. Now, many would argue that the Premier League wins and draws have come about more by luck than any kind of master plan that Lopetegui may have in place. 
it's suggested that had Palace, Brentford, Fulham and Man U, if they had their scoring boots on, uh, we may not have won or drawn that many games so far. Is that fair? Well, the stats uh, of each game might suggest something a little bit different. If we look at them, we we'll start off with uh, the Crystal Palace stats. Let me just uh, put myself up there and put that back up. If we look at the Crystal Palace stats, for example, yeah, they had more possession. They were the home team. But when it comes to things like shots, uh, shots on target, etc., we're pretty much even. We actually had more shots than them. We had more on target than them. We had more shots off target than them. Uh, and then when it comes to things like um, touches in the box, pretty much even. Uh, our goalie was slightly more uh, bus busier than theirs, uh, but we won aerial duels, etc. So you could see that uh, perhaps it was a lot closer, uh, or certainly the stats suggest, than we thought. When it comes to Ipswich, we should have dominated. We were the home team. Ipswich are a poor team. And that's what the stats proved. You know, 53% possession, far more shots than theirs, far more on target, far more off target, and so on and so forth. And then touches in the box again, dominance, and their keeper was far busier, uh, and so on. And then the game uh, against Man United at the weekend, okay, we were the home team. But Man U are meant to be, you know, meant to have better players, haven't they? Uh, so we only had 42% possession at home. They certainly had more shots. They certainly had more on target. Um, but um, when it comes to uh, other stats, you could see, again, uh, a little bit more even in things like uh, touches in the box uh, were pretty much even. Our goal is, without a doubt, far busier. Uh, but then aerial duels, etc., a little bit more um, balanced. So the stats themselves are suggesting that, yeah, OK, had these teams had their scoring boots on, we may have lost. But um, we are creating more chances and we do have more possession. And one of the things that we were talking about last season under Moyes was, you know, hardly any possession, boring football, sitting back and so on and so forth. So that has changed. I think, we, I think you know, um, the stats are beginning to demonstrate that uh, we are seeing a lot more of the ball. We are trying to do more with it, with the shots that we're having, et cetera, et cetera. But it hasn't just quite gelled for a whole game. Apart from the Ipswich game, we want to see more of that, I guess. You know, how we performed in the Ipswich game to go along throughout the whole 90 minutes rather than pockets that we've seen against other teams. Another thing that Lopetegui has been widely, widely uh, criticised for is that he doesn't seem to know his best team. Yet, Lopetegui has stated on several occasions that it's a squad effort, it's a squad game, and not just about the first 11 that get put out there. He has stated that every player is important and every player needs to be ready when called upon. And he's demonstrated that in the past 11 games that we've played. To date, of the 22 senior players available to him, I'm not including uh, Casey or any other under-21 player, uh, of the 22 senior players available to him, only Wes Fodringham has yet to make a Premier League uh, uh, appearance. And given that he's our third choice keeper, uh, an appearance is highly unlikely, unless, of course, we get serious injuries to both Ariola and Fabianski. And of course, Lopetegui makes full use of his subs in order to try and affect the course of a game, in order to try and change the course of a game. So if we compare the use of formations and tactics and players this season uh, to those things that we were experiencing under David Moyes, it kind of baffles me why fans are suggesting there's been no, chase, uh, no change and that Lopetegui is the Spanish David Moyes. Uh, let's think about it. On formation, Moyes stuck with a rigid 4-2-3-1, regardless of who we played. On tactics, Moyes stuck with a low block, even against lesser opposition, much to the dismay and an upset of the fans. On team selections, Moyes stuck with his core, what, 14, 15, 16 players throughout the season, whilst other players languished on the bench 
at, who may have had an influence if they were given half a chance. And ironically, when one or two players were given an opportunity, they did demonstrate that they could make a change. I remember Ink Danny Ings, for example, coming in one on in one game and scoring and so on, and then being put back on the bench again and never to be seen. And um, Moyes on subs persevered, didn't he, with the same players, regardless uh, of, of how the game was going. And he would only make, you know, uh, late subs when sometimes it was far too late in the game for them to be able to affect any change. So whereas Lopetegui is not afraid to make changes at any time in a game in order to affect change. There are changes to the way we played to the way we played last season. And I, for one, welcome the fact that we have a head coach who is not afraid to turn things around, change things around when things are not going right. Sure, you could argue that he should get things right in the first place, but thank goodness we have a head coach who is willing to admit he's got it wrong and making the changes when needed rather than waiting and waiting, hoping the players out there are going to finally turn up. Now, this implies a level of ruthlessness in, uh, in Lopetegui uh, that um, I don't think we had under David Moyes. Actually, no, Moyes had a kind of ruthlessness, but probably in a different way. When he didn't fancy a player, that player would be completely frozen out and isolated. I guess that was a form of ruthlessness by David Moyes. Whereas Lopetegui won't do that. He will show ruthlessness in replacing players, but will continue to demonstrate uh, that they are important and continue to be, be to be part of the squad. We could see this in the starting lineup against Man United on Saturday when he dropped Alphonse Ariola, replacing him with Fabianski. Uh, uh, Alvarez was back um, in the team after he was recently dropped. Then we saw the ruthlessness in action again at halftime uh, when underperforming Carlos Soler and Lucas Paqueta were replaced by Socek and Somerville. We saw in the game against Brentford a few weeks ago when Kudus was replaced at half-time for underperforming. And we've seen it in previous matches where Paqueta was replaced by Andy Irving for not performing. I quite like this approach. I don't think that's him not knowing what his team is. I think he knows exactly what his players are capable of. But sometimes if they're not going to be producing, then they're not going to stay in the team. It tells players that they've been that it tells players that they're all on a level pegging and if they want to stay in the starting lineup then they've got to perform and that's um and it doesn't matter whose name is on the back of their shirt and i think this will continue uh to see these changes i think that it will continue throughout the season and bring it on you know we can't complain when under moyes we were one dimensional and had a manager who wouldn't change his tactics or drop players regardless of performances. And now we complain that we have a manager who will adopt different tactics and change formations and change players, no matter who they are. Early on in the season, Lopetegui, as I said, he dropped Alvarez. And now it looks as if Alvarez has calmed down, fingers crossed, and he's won his place back in the side. He was an unsung hero against Man United at the weekend. And he even adapted during the game where his position was changed from that sort of central midfield to more of a, a sweeper type role where he played almost in between the two central defenders. And at the weekend, Lopetegui, as I've mentioned already, also dropped Ariola for, for poor performances. But I would like to think it won't be long before a chastened Ariola will be back in the starting lineup with a lot more focus on his performances so that he doesn't stand the risk of being dropped again. And I think the next player uh, who's in line to possibly lose his starting place is Lucas, Paque Lucas Paqueta, uh, where a spell may be on sidelines, may do him the world of good, given how poor he's been for quite some time now. We've only got to look at Paqueta's uh, Premier League stats this season to demonstrate just how off the mark he's been. And I'm going to be cheeky. And I did this at the beginning of the season. I compared stats between Paqueta and Socek. And I'm going to do it again because I think it's pretty valid. If you look at their stats, they both played the same number of games. Paqueta has had slightly more minutes uh, to Socek. Socek has been subbed 
more times than Paqueta has. Um, and when you look at things like goals, they've both got two goals, but one of those has come from the penalty spot for Paqueta. Uh, passing accuracy, where you would expect Paqueta to be better, actually goes to Socek. Now, you're all going to argue, like you did before, well, that that's obvious because all Socek does is he passes it sideways and backwards. You know, Paqueta's looking for that Hollywood pass, so obviously his passing accuracy is going to be a bit worse. I disagree. You know, yes, he definitely has more through balls. He definitely has more forward passes. Uh, but he does also more backward passes and sideway passes than Socek does. And then when it comes to uh, possession, probably the biggest uh, uh, thing uh, for Paqueta at the moment is he loses possession more than twice the number of times than Socek does. So I think it will be probably... Paqueta, who will probably lose his place this coming weekend against uh, Nottingham Forest. He was dropped at half time. He wasn't performing. Yes, he was also on a yellow card as well. Uh, but it will not surprise me if we see Paqueta being dropped from the starting lineup this week, this coming weekend. We'll see. If he does, it will continue to demonstrate that um, Lopetegui, you know, will expect more from his players. And being dropped will give them that hint that they have to perform better. Um, I'll be back with uh, more news. I know there's uh, stories out now about uh, Amarim, who's uh, looking like going to Man United. And uh, the West Ham fan base is, is losing it over that and saying that we missed a trick, et cetera, et cetera. And apparently there was a story that broke out on Wednesday, on Tuesday, that apparently we had an agreement in place uh, for Amarim to come in terms of salary, et cetera. And I double-checked that, and I've been told that that's not true. But I'll do a separate video on that. If you've enjoyed the content, please do hit the like button. If you've enjoyed it um, and you're not a subscriber, please do become a subscriber of the channel. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you all very soon.